Hello, and welcome to devlog number 27. You're going to have to forgive me for my voice on this one because I'm currently recovering from COVID for the third time, which, you know, has been really great. But I promised a devlog for this weekend, so a devlog you shall have. In this devlog, we're going to talk about some changes to existing mechanics that we've been experimenting with on our secret OSP testing branch, and then we're going to go over the full suite of OSP weapons that are now rigged up and in the game. So first, let's talk about railguns. I'm sure a number of people went back through the teaser rapid cut a couple times to really make sure they were seeing what they thought they were seeing. And then their eyes probably got a little wide when they realized what was going on. But before I talk about what we actually done and spoil it for those of you who didn't go back through the teaser, uh, let's talk about what the problems with railguns have been in the past and what they are now. I have admitted on the Discord a few times that I did over nerf rails during the missile update. And the reason that I did that is whenever you get any group of hardcore nebulous players together in any kind of balanced discussion, they're going to talk about rails and they're going to talk about jamming, which coincidentally are the two things that we're talking about at the beginning of this video. But the purpose of the missile update testing was to test missiles, and I'd rather have had one weapon be inadequate than have half of the game, which is the missile gameplay, be completely unplayable because everyone was so focused on rails the whole time. And contrary to popular belief, and despite the rail tiers, memes, and stickers, and all that, I really do care that rails are not performing at the level they should be right now, uh, but I don't want to keep shotgun testing things on the main branch, and so I wanted to save that for the OSP branch when we could test changes to rails holistically along with everything else. There have always been lots of complaints about rails. Before the missile update, it was that they were overpowered, and after the missile update, it's that they're useless, and we need to find a happy medium for that. So let's walk through the major problems and talk about the solutions that we've implemented on the test branch. Problem number one, railguns are always really hard to see. This one could and has been counter-argued that there are giant blue tracers telling you where they're coming from, but that also doesn't let you take advantage of any of the benefits of the tools that the game gives you to take action on that information. So to counteract this one, I've made it so that railguns, when they're firing, will briefly bloom the signature of a ship, which might not seem like it does anything because of the maximum radar range, but the way that signature bloom works now is that it actually changes the physical radius of the signature. To give some numbers for an easy example, a ship that's had its radar signature bloom to 5 kilometers would be visible at 15 kilometers to a radar with a max of 10 kilometer range. It doesn't change much from the shooter's perspective because they're still well outside weapons range for almost everything except really long range missiles. But for the receiver, it provides them with much more actionable information that they can use to coordinate with their team rather than trying to place down a ping somewhere within the vicinity of where they think it's coming from. Number two, current railguns don't do nearly enough damage to be effective. When it comes to tweaking railgun damage, it's a really, really weird balance. Railguns have the accuracy and speed to be able to hit small ships, and so increasing damage on them to do more damage to larger ships also hurts small ships quite a bit. And so a brilliant suggestion from Balanced Discussion, and I'm sorry, I don't know who made the suggestion, but we've made it so that railgun rounds are no longer affected by damage reduction. This way, railguns can do a reasonable amount of damage to large ships without being overpowered against small ships which have naturally less damage reduction. I've also changed the way that overpen damage is applied for railgun rounds so that it's now 60% for the first component and then 60% of that remainder for the second and so on, so that damage isn't getting sapped by the 20 components that that railgun round might hit. And problem number three, there isn't really a lot of counterplay or defensive options against railguns, or that counterplay is basically impossible to pull off in an actual battle situation. With the signature bloom, we've made counterplay a little bit easier, but there still needs to be some kind of defensive option against artillery. And that defensive option is that point defense weapons can now shoot down railgun rounds. This may sound insane at first, but I promise you that in the test builds that we're doing, the testers are actually really positive about the change, and it's actually, if you can believe it, increasing point defense diversity. Most people's initial reaction is probably that, well, with how fast railgun rounds move compared to hybrids, the only way to shoot them down would be lasers, so that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but non-kinetic or explosive point defenses like flak or lasers doesn't do well against railgun rounds, because keep in mind that these are tungsten rods and lasers destroy by heat. Whereas the Defender, where you're putting dozens of rounds at any given point of space against something that's traveling in a straight line, they're going to slam into that and make it much more likely that it's going to shatter. I often talk about how the simulation-based nature of Nebulous makes it so that small things can have compounding impacts. Because point defense turrets take time to traverse, that makes it so that multi-axis railgun attacks such as from a group of rail destroyers versus a single rail battleship have a greater probability of getting through because the turrets are going to be slewing all over the place. In order to make this viable, I actually had to also do a bunch of improvements to PD, not in terms of their actual hard values or their balance numbers, uh, in terms of how they're actually tasked and in terms of how they lead their targets. 
Thanks to Puppy from Hell for pointing out that the iterative lead solver that the game uses to calculate lead can actually diverge from the correct solution at high velocities. So I went back and I rewrote the lead solver as an actual quadratic equation solver, uh, which gets the correct answer every time in only a single step. So that improves the defender quite a bit as well as the other projectile-based point defense turrets. But another huge benefit to point defense actually has its roots in the enhanced data miner update that came out a month ago. As part of that update, in order for point defenses to know how many missiles they shot down, the do damage function actually gives a, uh, an output value now that tells if the target was destroyed. With this new output value, it's now possible for point defenses to know in the exact same frame when they destroyed a missile, and now they're able to actually call back to the point defense controller and say, I destroyed my target, give me a new one immediately. Whereas previously they'd have to wait until the next cycle of the PD controller, which could be up to two seconds for them to be assigned a new target. Okay, that was a lot of talking about railguns, but still not as much as balanced discussion is done. And now let's move on to the next hot topic, which is jamming, and I promise this one will be a lot shorter. I had someone direct message me on Twitter recently, and there was also a Steam forums thread about this, but basically saying, I can't play your game because the jamming effect is going to make me have a seizure. And I really want to fix that. I've put a lot of work into making the game accessible with all the accessibility options that we have, but I pretty quickly realized that any kind of accessibility option that would tone down the effect of jamming would also make it so that anyone not playing with that accessibility option on would be at a huge disadvantage. And what that basically meant was that any changes to jamming to make the game more accessible to people who have any kind of photosensitivity issue would have to be a change to the mechanic in general. So what you can see here is that the jamming effect has been changed to be a lot gentler on the eyes. The tracks don't move around nearly as much. They're not all constantly jumping. They jump now randomly between 5 and 30 seconds per track. The appearance of them is kind of meant to convey a pending track sort of situation where the radar is detecting something, but it hasn't quite transitioned to a true track yet. And something I haven't done yet, but I do want to do is make it so that new real tracks, like for a ship or something, show this pending icon for the first second or so. So it kind of, it's not going to have any gameplay impact. You could still fire on it as normal if you could actually click on it fast enough, but it will kind of create that psychological connection between a new track that hasn't transitioned yet and what these jamming tracks represent. And then finally, we have a new mechanical feature, which is these jamming strobe bearing lines. So you'll get one of these for every active jammer. They are uh, able to be fired on. You can right-click them and, and treat them like any other track. So that should make it a little easier to fire home on jam missiles down a bearing, for example. The only difference between this and like an elint lob is that these don't show up when you don't have the ship selected, so you only get to see where the jamming's coming from for the ship you have currently selected. One of the things I like about this is that it turns jamming into more of a covering mechanic for other ships rather than just make your own ship invisible. Because now by turning a jammer on, you're basically telling the enemy the direction that you're in. Even though they don't have a true track on you, they can still fire ordnance in that direction. Whereas other ships that you might be covering with that jamming are still protected. Right now, every radar is capable of establishing these strobe lines. However, uh, based on balance testing that we still have to do, it might be only some radars and there will be a module that will unlock it for other radars, but all pending testing. I honestly didn't expect half of this devlog to be talking about stuff that already exists in the game, but now we're finally going to move on to OSP. In terms of general status, the update is really coming along. Most of the stuff that needs to be done code-wise is done. Just need to finish up weapon models and clipper models, which we're going to show off in a little bit. We've had a secret test build up for our permanent testers to play around with for about the last month. Uh, the Discord did notice that by checking SteamDB. They did find us out, but uh, the actual contents of the build has kind of been kept under wraps. But we are going to open up the build for the rest of the testers that we were planning to take. It's going to be a, a subset of the missile testers who helped us out. And we're probably going to be pulling those people in only a couple hours after this video goes live so we can actually start balance testing for real. Last devlog, I showed off the models for the bulk freighters, but those are now actually finally complete. So we have the final textures on them. All of their LODs and uh, UV maps and stuff are done so they can actually receive damage according to the game's damage model. It also didn't make a lot of sense to us that the paint pattern on all these ships that all look so different uh, for each individual instance would be the same. So the uh, dazzle camo pattern that you see on the hull is actually unique per ship instance. The actual offset in the 3D space that's used to generate the camo patterns is unique per ship and then it stays with that ship. So when you save the fleet, you'll always get the same camo pattern back. Next, we'll move on to the clippers, which are the set of smaller ships that the OSP uses on the opposite end of the spectrum from the line ships. Before I show these, uh, do know that the textures on them are actually just the sprinter textures stretched all over them because there needs to be some uh, texture on the shader in order for it to not throw a bunch of errors, so it will look a little funny. This first one is the shuttle, which is basically a short-range passenger transport. 
It's a little hard to tell due to the messed up textures, but some of the geometry on the surface is meant to look like additional armor plating that's been welded on, which you can see on the front thrusters, uh, covering some of the windows on the sides. And that'll be common across all the other clippers that we'll see. This one's got two class two mounts, one on the top and one on the bottom, and then a class one mount for defense up on top. Next up, we've got the tug or maintenance vessel. The name for this one is still kind of up in the air for what we really want to call it. This is the lowest of the OSP ships that gets the spinal. So it's got a medium sized spinal. And uh, the OSP actually has a couple different fixed weapon sizes that we'll talk about when we get to the weapon section. But this one's got one of those on the front, some class ones on the sides, and then a, two class threes on the top and bottom. This one makes a pretty good utility ship, but it can also do a lot of damage with uh, the ability to mount a 450 millimeter spinal cannon. And the last of the three clippers is the cargo feeder. This one's got the ability to mount a single spinal that has the same size as one of the line ships. So you can have an array of these that has the double 450 millimeter guns. Uh, and then it's also got a fair amount of large turret mounts on the top and sides. This one's kind of a destroyer equivalent. It even has the hull symbol to match. All three of those hulls are approaching final geometry. They have a little bit more to go before we move on to actually doing the textures and all that. And at this time, we're only planning on doing three of the nine clipper concepts that we have because they all kind of fill the same role with some minor variation. And with the work that it takes to implement a single hull, combined with the fact that we don't want them all to step on each other, we kind of want them each to have their own unique thing. That's going to get a lot harder as a number of clippers would increase. And for our last topic, let's move on to the set of weapons that the OSP has. One of the most frustrating things to see in the YouTube comments and the discussion on the Discord is a constant worry that the OSP is going to be completely outclassed in every way by the Alliance, and that anyone who plays that faction is just going to get completely trounced because they just won't have what they need. But I promise you that what the OSP is designed to fight is at the forefront of our mind when we're doing the design for the faction. And I will also say that in both of the test games that we played in order to film this devlog, uh, the OSP won handily and only lost a handful of ships despite the Alliance getting basically wiped. What I'm going to show off here is not a viable fleet at all, but just a way for me to slap all the weapons on something so you can see them. So first off, we've got a bunch of casemated weapons. I said in the last devlog that turrets are going to be pretty hard to come by for this faction because turrets are complicated, they're hard to maintain, they're hard to engineer, and so fixed weapons or casemated weapons with very limited traversal arcs are going to be the mainstay for them. There are four sizes for these, small, medium, large, and extra large, with this being a medium size one. There's one weapon that's smaller than this one, which is a 250mm that I'm not going to show off for this, but uh, you can see it in the screenshots on Discord. Jumping up a little bit in size to our extra large casemates, these are our double 450mm C65 guns. With the rate of fire and the barrel count of these, this actually allows a line ship to have more firepower than a Solomon battleship per side. The reason for that is that it needs to make up for the limitations of the ship, the fact that it can only fire one side at a time, and the fact that it needs to turn the whole ship in order to be able to fire. And you'll see that this is common throughout the faction's design, where a lot of the weapons are designed to make up for shortcomings that the faction would otherwise have. One thing that's interesting about the casemate weapons is that I actually rewrote a lot of how the fixed weapons are aimed in order to make the system more flexible and able to do a lot more things. Right now, when you're playing with the SIS or the PRISM mod, which both have ships with multiple spinal weapons, what's actually happening is that each spinal weapon is telling the ship which direction to point in, and whichever one happens to do it last is the one that wins out. It just so happens that all of them are pointed in the same direction, so it really doesn't matter too much. With the casemates, you could put four of these guns on each side of the ship and group them all together, so how's the ship going to know which way it needs to point? So now, the way that fixed weapons work is that they actually know which direction they're facing in, they cooperate with all the other fixed weapons in their group to determine which way the ship needs to aim. And so that adds a ton of flexibility to the system, so you can do all kinds of things with casemates, or fixed weapons in general, that you weren't able to do before. Taking a look at Plasma next, which is a unique weapon to the OSP because they're going to be dealing with ships that have pretty heavy armor comparatively, uh, Plasma is basically designed to strip armor away from heavy targets. The way it works in lore is that it's a magnetic bottle essentially that's shot out of a coil gun, and when it impacts the surface it shatters and releases its plasma to melt that armor away. We're still playing around a little bit with how we want the mechanics for this to work. Right now it just creates a gigantic armor splash. Um, in a way that actually counteracts some seam issues that we see with larger damage in, in the way the game works. But we're also going to experiment with a lingering melting kind of effect or something that boosts signature along with it. A lot of people are probably also happy to see that the MLS, both MLS 2 and 3, are coming back. They've been reworked a little bit to use programming channels per missile in the same way that the VLS does. The reason for that is that with the number of these modules that you can mount on the large line ships, having only one channel be used to program a whole magazine full of missiles would be a little insane. 
For the OSP's railgun equivalent, we've got a fixed mass driver, same as they have, except this one is meant to be literally a piece of repurposed mining equipment. It fires these large 500 millimeter, what we're calling fracturing blocks. Basically what they're used for in a mining context is to burrow down into larger asteroids or to shatter small ones apart. So instead of having the insane armor piercing capability that the Alliance railgun rounds have, these ones impact on the surface and basically create a small explosion and work in the same way that a missile warhead does where they shoot a bunch of damage rays out into the hull. Because the OSP doesn't really have very high grade missile tech, at this point we're not planning for them to have hybrids. This kind of serves as their hybrid weapon that is a high velocity missile warhead type damaging system. For the OSP's point defenses, we've got a couple different options. I talked about the big defender last time, but I don't think I showed it in action. We've also got a rotary version of the Stonewall. And then our first dual purpose jammer. So this is actually an electro optical uh, laser dazzler and it is dual purpose. So you can actually jam an area by yourself or if it detects any missiles, it'll also jam down that direction as well. Then we've got this weird looking thing, which is meant to be an industrial assembly line cutting laser that's been repurposed for shooting down missiles. There is a bug with it right now though. So unfortunately you're not gonna get to see it shoot anything down. E-War is going to be an important balance to strike for the OSP because they're up against an enemy that has superior radar technology and uh, they need to basically be able to counter that. So this is the OSP radar jammer. It's directional. It's more powerful than the blanket, but it also has a shorter duration time. The OSP also gets an omnidirectional radar jammer, which the Alliance doesn't have, which kind of serves as a, a radar missile shield, essentially. This next one is their Illuminator. Uh, so this was originally going to be their fire control radar, uh, but I changed it to be the Illuminator because I realized that they actually were going to need one of those. It's got a pretty narrow cone, but a really long range. And then this thing up here is going to be your fire control. Uh, it's a lot shorter range than the Alliance one, but it doesn't have that many use cases because most of the OSP equipment is pretty short range anyway. And finally, we've got this thing, which I loved seeing the speculation going around about what it was, and I did see that a number of people correctly identified it. So the OSP isn't going to get an ELINT system, and the reason for that is that making an accurate direction finding system is really hard. But for a faction like this that basically lives or dies based on its ability to properly read the battle space and lay ambushes, uh, you need some kind of long-range detection capability. So what this is is a directional, long-range, low-bandwidth, low-frequency early warning radar. Yes, a real-world radar like this would be many times its size, however, due to game constraints and having to make sure the thing fits on a mount and that it doesn't intersect with parts of the ship when it turns, I did have to scale it down a little bit, but I tried to make it as accurate looking as I could. This is a new type of radar that I specifically implemented just for the OSP. It's unlike any other radar that's currently in the game, and the way that it works is that you'll point it in a direction by giving it a fire order like you would with a jammer, for example, and it will turn to that area and actually turn on as a radar and start developing tracks. It has a pretty wide cone, but anything outside of its cone, it's not going to be able to see, so it doesn't have the same kind of omnidirectional search capability that the panel-based radars do. It's got really horrible accuracy, like two kilometers of positional error, as you can see from the dot jumping all over the place here, but it has incredible range. It'll go all the way out to, I think I set it to 18 kilometers for this first pass. And what you can use this for is uh, basically scanning areas that you think the enemy might be doing your own manual area searches. The Spyglass actually originally had long, long range like this, but uh, in the pre-alpha, we cut that down to what it is now because you know, on a map like Pillars, as soon as you spawn, you were able to detect the enemy, and it kind of just cut down on all the mystery and the hunting of the game. However, I think that a directional system that needs to be manually steered and can only see certain portions of the sky at a given time is a fair balance trade-off for this range. And that about wraps it up for the OSP equipment preview. We're going to start our actual balance testing passes now when we bring in the testers later tonight. The interesting thing for the OSP for me is that it's kind of having the opposite effect with the missile update, where when I started the missile update, I was super excited to get to work on it. And then by the end, I was just so drained and burnt down on it that I just wanted to get it done. But with the OSP, I started it like, well, we have to have multiple factions. So this is just something that we're going to have to slog through. But the further that we get into the factions development and the more cool stuff we get to implement, it's really just exciting. And I'm getting more and more excited about the update as we go. And I hope that you're all really excited to play it and that you like what you've been seeing. Our secret test branch people have been having a lot of fun with it, and I can't wait to see what the new testers are going to say when they get their hands on it. So that concludes this devlog. Thank you for watching.